Lieutenant General Thomas, thank you so much for giving your thoughts to the Combating Terrorism Center today. Sure, good to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. I'd like to start with the threat that this country is currently facing. In your estimation and from your vantage point, who is the enemy that we are fighting and where do they operate from the area of greatest strength? Well, um, unfortunately, that, that's a, 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 my, my answer could take up the rest of the interview time in terms of the number and type of, types of threats that we're facing right now. My particular interest is the extremist threat that's been manifested in, in certainly, the, certainly the Sunni extremism that we've faced uh, both originally in Iraq and then uh, Afghanistan, or Afghanistan originally and then in Iraq, and then as it's morphed now to the, from the North African littoral all the way through to Afghanistan and Pakistan. But that doesn't uh, unfortunately, uh, account for other looming threats like Russia, China, etc. Um, so I, uh, the nature of the threat, as I described it, you know, for, for my particular interest uh, uh, from a counterterrorism standpoint, um, is broad. Um, it's expansive. It's you could argue it's runaway with uh, now four uh, failed states: Libya, Iraq, Syria, and, and now Yemen. Um, and it's competitive, which I think is the worst aspect of it: is that they're literally vying with each other to be more heinous. Um, to truly take the mantle over in terms of what's the, you know, who is, who is, who are the new leaders of, of uh, the Sunni extremist movement, formerly Al Qaeda, uh, senior leadership now under, you know, under a lot of duress and, and uh, from a com competitive standpoint from ISIL. So um, it's the worst of all worlds for us as, as we see a kind of competitive flavor to extremism that uh, many would have liked to have thought had dissipated over the, over the last couple of years. One of the things that comes up often when you talk about combating terrorism is, is the use of definitions or the, the right words to uh, describe what's going on, who the enemy is, what victory looks like, what defeat would look like. Why is it so important? Can you comment on why it's so important that we get the definitions right? Certainly from a military mindset, if you can't explain what your strategy is, what winning looks like, which for, you know, for many years uh, we were afraid to even put a you know, put a definition, you know, uh, uh, because I thought I think we were afraid of losing. Uh, you know, as you as you throw a definition of winning down, you, you can always uh, box your, uh, back yourself into a corner. Um, but I think from you know, from a leadership standpoint, if we can't explain uh, to the nation, to subordinates, to you know, to the collective whole, what we're trying to accomplish, then then your your strategy is is uh, by nature ill-defined and, and and harder to achieve. So. Uh, um, I, I have um, struggled, as, as many of us have, in terms of uh, defining what winning looks like, uh, what, what, what are our strate strategic objectives, um, but it's something that, and I think it needs to be an active discourse. It just can't be, I put it out there and now I can't reflect on it. We, we, we may need to modify it. We may need to acknowledge that it's not achievable, you know, uh, based on changing conditions, but I, I do think it's, it's essential to have that baseline. And then I do have problems that we have thrown counterterrorism as a method when reality is, you know, counterterrorism is a very niched activity um, that has some traits, some some uh, some applications that may be apropos, but uh, it's certainly not the panacea for you know for what we're facing. The current fight against terrorism has evolved into a whole of government approach that requires improved relationships across agencies that have different agendas and different goals and different interests. Can you explain how your command coordinates intelligence and? planning and operations across geographic combatant command boundaries and intergovernmental agencies. How does that work? Well, I, I think it, it, it took a while, but we've all acknowledged that we do come from different backgrounds, different uh, different gene pools, you know, the, the, uh, the much ballyhooed uh, document that I think was seminal in terms of, you know, uh, uh, state is from Venus, you know, uh, defense is from Mars or, or things like that, at least described that we're different going in. Um, but I think what's evolved over time is that we've accepted in most cases that we have shared problems. Um, in many cases, we've muscled through uh, options to get, to, get after, uh, you know, the, you know, to get after solutions, absent a strategy or absent an overarching uh, you know, kind of approach. Um, so I think, you know, to your point, is if, if we can reflect on, uh, as, especially as we hit the rockier parts of the relationship, what are, we, what are we, big we, trying to accomplish? I think that's always beneficial to be able to reflect back on that than to, to, to to recalibrate against what are the options that we can do. Um, special operations really has grown up over the last 14 years in terms of, uh, to your point, um, understanding the milieu, uh, who's, who are the players, who are the, what are the equities at stake, um, and as importantly, trying to, trying to be that catalyst 
uh, for discussion, for problem solving, not necessarily to have all the solutions. And I, I think we've suffered from that too often where we think we, got, we have to have the solution. We DOD and we special operations specifically. Um, I, think, I think we're more inclined now to uh, consider you know, a multitude of options and then be part of that solution as, as best we can and to the appropriate role uh, that, that we're designated to play. So in the last 14 years, it's your assessment that we're doing a better job than we, than we did previously. Are we getting there? I, I think we've made uh, you know, uh, huge improvements in terms of interoperability and, and communications, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of effectiveness in, in exchanging. Um, the process is still, uh, in my mind, uh, far too bureaucratic um, and, and far too stagnant uh, for a very, very dynamic situation. So um, um, it, that's, that is one of my, and, and I'm unfortunately blessed and cursed by being in an organization that is dynamic by nature. And in fact, uh, somebody recently, recently challenged us that, um, that you can't predict the rate of change, and so the really effective organizations, which I like to think we are, are ready to snap link into whatever the change is tomorrow, I can, I can go that way. And, and I think we can, uh, but I think we're in, we're in a very isolated position where we might snap link into the, to the rocket ship as it takes off and we'll, we'll look around and there won't be anybody with us, that we're, we're, we're in kind of an isolated situation. So how do we calibrate our ability to react at, at literally the speed of war with you know, the rest of our compatriots who, who may or may not be inclined to, to go that rapidly? So much of this fight necessarily is, is something that your command takes on. Um, is that a sustainable model going forward, or would you rather be sharing in this fight um, with some of the other uh, their commands? That's a great question. In fact, we, we're suffering through uh, you know kind of a continuing or continuous identity crisis at, uh, at JSOC in, in terms of um, have we evolved to what we should be doing? And, and the, the operative kind of word is always should, uh, not what we can be doing or what we could be doing, but should be doing. Um, in almost every case, you know, we, we reflect on, is this something that needs to be done? Invariably, the answer is yes. Um, is there anybody else out there doing it right now? And in the absence of, of that, typically we have you know, thrust ourselves on a problem, um, but it has caused us some challenge. And it's, it's organizationally stretched us. Uh, but to your point, I do think it's sustainable. Um, we, we are you know, blessed with, with all the resources we need uh, and, and certainly the talent to, to bear. Um, I think it'll be more sustainable if we were less frustrated in our efforts. And when I say that, is I'm, I'm told no more than go on, on the magnitude of about 10 to 1 um, on, on almost a daily basis. So I think uh, it will be more sustainable if, if our workforce, if our team sees the fruits of their labors as opposed to the frustration of we could do more, we should do more, and we can't. And uh, so I, I, have to kind of, I have to regulate my own frustration there to, to make sure it doesn't you know, trickle down to the force and, and that they are similarly, you know, similarly frustrated that you know, we could be doing more. You mentioned Yemen and when you look at countries like Yemen, yeah. Libya, Nigeria in some ways, countries where there are swaths of territory that are either ungoverned or undergoverned, what can and should special operation forces be doing in these scenarios? Specifically, should they be concentrating on long-term capacity building with these countries or should they simply focus on short, uh, short-term short operations? Yeah. Um, ideally, I think you'd like to get ahead of the bow wave and, and have some sort of uh, realized stability, uh, you know, something, something you can sustain over time without, uh, you know, without undue resources, um, with the ability to illuminate threats before they come to you. Um, yeah, that's, that's the ideal world. Unfortunately, we're, you, know, you, you can point to more places on the map where that's not the case than, than it is the case. Um, so in the case of Yemen right now, where you had a government that just imploded, um, I think we are back in the mode of where, are, you know, what are the threats that are, you know, that are uh, brewing there now? You know, how might they come at us, and what could we, should we do the, about them? Whether it's unilaterally or, you know, with other partners. The new interesting partners for Yemen are Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE, and others. It would, so it doesn't necessarily have to be U.S. We we could do it through through other folks, but it's a different mindset instead of through a Yemeni, you know, uh, 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 sovereign force. It may be through other through other partners. Um, so I, 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 you know, I, I think we all acknowledge we'd love to be, you know, uh, more, f more forward thinking in terms of uh, a sustainable security end state. But reality is, uh, you know, facts on the ground. The threat of today uh, requires us to do some things in extremis or, or uh, you know, um, you know in, a, in, a, in a very um, ad hoc fashion as opposed to a more uh, deliberate approach. 
I'd like to ask you about captured battlefield documents. Sure. Apart from their immediate tactical value, what do we gain long term by studying these items? Clearly, um, if, if we spend enough time looking at some of these documents and you can aggregate them and correlate them, I think you can get a, um, uh, you know, an insight into the intent and the mindset of the enemy that you otherwise would not have just by individual captures or, or individual documents. So, um, and I think we've, we've done well over time, certainly you know, what CTC has done here with um, uh, you know, uh, unclassified aggregation of information and, and, and kind of uh, you know, more holistic uh, analytic approach has been really valuable to, to the rest of us who are otherwise in a frantic um, you know, uh, target of the moment or uh, you know, uh, uh, intelligence collection of the moment that, uh, that may not be conducive to seeing the big picture. So uh, I, I think the ability to, to amass these things and to, to correlate uh, to each other, to each other rather, I think is, is tremendously valuable. You're here for a senior conference at West Point, and there are uh, individuals from across the sectors here, business and NGOs. Um, what do you personally gain from the discussions that are happening at, at a conference like this? The opportunity to think. The nature of our business does, isn't, isn't conducive to, to a lot of uh, reflection, a lot of thinking, other than reflecting on the target of the moment or maybe the, the opportunity uh, you know, that, that avails. Um, so uh, an opportunity like this where you literally can detach for most most intents and purposes from from your email and, and whatnot and, and then focus on the problem at hand which is which is uh, dire I think is, is really valuable the leaders of tomorrow's army and tomorrow's battles are being educated here at West Point and at universities and locations across the United States what can young men and women though learn or, or be trained in that will best enable them to succeed in the fight that they're going to be facing um, I, th I think a grounding in a couple things. One, the nature of war. I mean, we're, we're training you know, future military leaders, so um, to understand the nature of conflict, uh, the nature of relationships, uh, and the history and the culture that plays. Um, I mentioned uh, to, uh, to someone as we convened here that uh, you know, 35 years ago when I was a senior here um, was when we had the Iran hostage situation. We didn't talk about that while I was here. We didn't reflect on it. Uh, we were, it, it was almost a, an indication of how sequestered we were here at West Point while world events were going on. So I, I think I would, I would compel you know, some of the young leaders here today, and, and many of them do seem much more worldly and, and, and have a much broader perspective. It may be the nature of our, you know, the, the explosion of media. Uh, I don't know what to attribute to it exactly, but they seem you know, more uh, conscientious of what's going on in the world, and I, I, I would compel them to stay that way because uh, you know, they, they don't understand the world order at their great risk because they will be thrown into some, some nasty locations here in the future that none of us can predict, um, and, and how broadly prepared they are for it will be to their advantage. Many believe that despite its growth, an organization like ISIL uh, cannot defeat us militarily, but the question might be that how do we defeat them? And I wondered if you could speak to um, what you think that might take uh, and how long you anticipate it might take. Um, I think it depends on the level of effort. Um, I, I think that we have identified this as a long war as much as a pacing item that we can't solve it in a hurry, so that, ergo it must be a long war. Um, but I've been disappointed by the fact that it, that's also tempered our response where are we in a war? If so, are we going to ramp up on the level of a World War II or a, world, you know, or a, or a Korean War effort or even a Vietnam War effort uh, f to the level that it requires? Um, I, I haven't seen that yet. I've, I've seen you know, surges, too many surges, but I have not seen you know, a, a sustained approach above and beyond just the military approach. Um, you know, our our uh, efforts in the, in the security line of operations are critical. I'd say they're almost you know, kind of the, the, the lead turn that must happen to enable governance, to enable you know, considerations for other things. But um, I think we have to put the, the level of effort into it to, to ensure that we can even consider defeating uh, an ISIL. Arguably, the whole phenomenon of, of extremism has changed our existence. So uh, there's a lot of people that argue or discuss whether or not um, this phenomenon is an existential threat. I'd say just by the nature of the world, it's changed our existence. Um, again, when I was speaking to a, to a bunch of young co-eds lately, um, and I said, even the way we go to the airport, and one of them was kind enough to remind me that it's been that way all my life. You're an old person, you know, but uh, I was able to say we weren't always like this. You could wait till the last minute to go to a, to go to an air, you know, to a terminal and, and check in, and now you have to go through all these procedures. So arguably, they've already affected our way of life, and and I'm hoping that you know it doesn't continue on that trend in the future.
you know, you could you could go down the rat hole of why do we uh, monitor ourselves vis-a-vis -vis NSA actions, things like that, and arguably it's there's there's the cause and effect is is directly traceable to this phenomenon. If I can, just one last sure. question. It's a it's a complex fight that that you're in and that we are all in. What are our metrics for success, and are they appropriate in your estimation? I think getting you know understanding what you're trying to measure, um, which um, I, I see a tendency, and maybe I'm from the camp that thinks this is as much subjective as it is objective. But you know wh how you can you know balance both empirical data and and your feel for where we are, what we need to accomplish, are, are kind of the keys. I, I do think we have uh, too many folks that you can't see the trees for the forest because of the data that's been arrayed and, and that they've requested in more cases than not, the metrics that they've demanded that doesn't really tell them what they need to know. So um, I'm, I, I fault more to a subjective feel. And, and to that point, you can't look at the array right now and not, not sense that we're losing. We're losing across the board, um, you know, from the North African littoral all the way through to Afghanistan and Pakistan. There's some good news stories. Uh, argue, ironically, Afghanistan and, and Pakistan are in a good place right now given the cooperation with the Pakistanis and given the uh, Ghani government. You know, folks didn't expect that as, as recently as a year ago. Um, but across the board, we're not winning. And I, I don't know that you need a lot of empirical data to tell you that. Lieutenant General Thomas, thank you so much for spending a few moments with us. Sure. Thank, thank my, you. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah.